Good afternoon and welcome to our 18th annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. We've been here since 1995 discussing this very innovative and important sector of our increasingly renewable energy market. Uh, for our next topic, we're going to be discussing all those contributors, or one major contributor to the fuel cell economy, coming from the outside and helping us to do what we do. Uh, without these larger companies, we really would be lost. So I'd like you to welcome with me Dr. Raymond Strobel, who's the Director of European Fuel Cells Projects at Dana Holding Corporation. Uh, welcome, Raymond Strobel. Hi, Brian. Hi, Raymond. So, Raymond, uh, uh, Many people in the fuel cell industry may be unaware. Um, uh, it's funny, your company has such a large reputation, a reputation beyond. Uh, maybe we could start with just a description. What is uh, Dana Holding Corporation? How large? A bit about its history. Could you tell us something about Dana? Yeah, Dana is a large automotive uh, component supplier since uh, more than uh, 105 years uh, active in the component business mm -hmm. to provide, uh, for example, the Ford uh, T module uh, in the early uh, 20th century. Um, <laughs> and um, based on that, the company grow uh, globally and um, has today a turnaround of about uh, 5 billion uh, euro worldwide and um, in the range of 25,000 uh, employees. So you've been in the automotive market ever since we had to crank the cars. That's correct, yes. How did you progress uh, from uh, component manufacturing to uh, getting involved in this rather peculiar hydrogen and fuel cell industry? Well, in the mid-90s, the, the whole activity in fuel cell got more and more popular. And uh, for us, it's always important uh, to look for new markets uh, for our uh, plants. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we were at that time quite optimistic that there will be a, a um, market in the automotive industry and the powertrain that will be driven by a fuel cell um, stack and the fuel cell powertrain. Unfortunately, this uh, took longer than we expected at that time. And uh, now <laughs> we are continuously investing since more than uh, 15 years uh, in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this this saga of things taking longer than we initially expected. I've been saying this for 10 years. It hasn't deterred you, though, from continually uh, being involved. Uh, were you disappointed with certain phases of the development? Well, we certainly uh, see the ups and downs in the industry. It's, uh, the thematic of fuel cells gets more popular and then uh, it slows down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But every time when it comes up again, we see more players and the ones that survive the downturn, um, they are in a better position uh, to support the industry. Yeah, yeah this is, uh, there's been such a process of consolidation, changing companies have come and gone, yeah. uh, but you are a continuous partner all through this development. Yeah, we, we try to be very selective in uh, who we partner with mm -hmm. and uh, also in what areas we are working and uh, to, to have some sort of discipline in how we spend our money mm -hmm. and um, in a way to survive in a, in a, in a sort of a focused mode, um, mm -hmm. also in the downturn phases. So you get to choose the girl at the dance. <laughs> what, what sort of criterium? That's what we try to do. <laughs> yeah, I do too, it never yeah. works. And what sort of criterium do you use in order to choose who exactly to get involved with? Uh, uh, do you have a particular, is it uh, your um, expertise that determine who you uh, partner with? Or is it their requests? Is it a combination? Well, we, we try to understand the, the business plans that are shown to us, mm -hmm. as well as the the, um, the level of product, what um, the potential customer has, and based on that, we try to make our assessment, mm -hmm. and uh, where we can, if we can invest in this area, or not, or uh, mm -hmm. how should uh, the arrangement and the cooperation with uh, particular uh, customers look like. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps we should mention uh, specifically. Uh, what type of components for what type of fuel cell products you actually deal with? Yeah, we have uh, installed uh, global centers of excellence uh, where we focus on certain products. Uh, for example, on the stack side, we mainly focus on stacks, uh, on plates with integrated uh, seals. Mm -hmm. And um, on the um, balance of plane side, we focus 
uh, on components that are related to thermal management uh, characteristics like heat exchanger modules, for example, for the forklift uh, industry that uh, takes now uh, more and more uh, commercial stage, uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, we provide reformer units for uh, stationary units, backup power, uh, mm -hmm. um, and so on, telecom towers, things like that. Um, as well, on the plate side, we look for the stationary and the automotive market, mainly on the PEM side. Uh, where we provide uh, graphite composite plates as well as metallic bipolar plates. Uh, now, I noticed in that uh, whole array of products, you didn't necessarily mention company names. Is it more of a private issue who you partner with, or is it yes. also so? That's a mainly mm -hmm. private issue. We can say that we are in zero production with some of the components, but we cannot really talk about who it is. And mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Larger companies simply have expertise. I mean, you work a lot with uh, mass manufacturing. Uh, we in the fuel cell industry, we have this huge issue of um, it's largely developmental. Uh, yeah. If we have a good idea, a good concept, and even a good product, it is not easy for a small company to move towards mass production. Uh, so is this something you're focused on, looking for potential mass-produced, mass-market products or at least larger scale products and getting involved there? I think that's our main focus, to look who's going to be on the market early, mm -hmm. uh, because our focus is really to mass manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to design with our partners then the product mm -hmm. for mass manufacturing markets. Mm -hmm. So our focus is design for manufacturing with our engineering uh, support to our, with, to our customers. Uh, you mentioned already one uh, specific, uh, uh, some people would call it a niche market, um, things like uh, forklift trucks, uh, small devices that work indoors or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, those mobile applications have an other demands than stationary applications. So uh, uh, what are the material issues that you deal with? Do you help the manufacturers also? We know that mobile applications, for instance, they have to deal with some vibration. Yeah. Uh, they have certainly a different working environment. Uh, you can't recover the heat necessarily as you could with a stationary PEM yeah. cell. So there's a whole series of different reflections involved. Are you involved in developing the optimum materials for that? Yeah, that's usually based on a scope of requirements. Uh, mm -hmm. What we are looking at here and together with the customer, sometimes we have to create it since it's in a new market. Um, and uh, this is the basis uh, of the, the whole design process of the product. Mm -hmm. So when we have to uh, get rid of the heat, for example, on portable applications, we have to make sure uh, that we can dump the heat in the right way and, and get rid of it in the system. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the cost factors also, are you uh, 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 sometimes uh, involved in making choices? We do have to sometimes choose between the most effective uh, bipolar plate yeah. or the least expensive. Yeah, do you offer variations of that? Yeah, it's, it's certainly um, a challenge in an early stage of a market to, to choose the right, um, the right material. Um, for um, the certain the, the low vo volume uh, mm -hmm. and if it, that's going to make it also for the mass manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, high volume market mm -hmm. and this is uh, this is the benefit what we have as a company providing uh, graph graphite composite plates as well as metallic bipolar plates so what we can do is uh, to really uh, support the customer from the early uh, lower volume market and grow with them uh, and maybe transfer then the materials from uh, one type of uh, plate material to another type, to mass manufacturing type of plate. Uh, do you already anticipate a significant reduction in costs? Simply when you start to mass manufacture, you're using different processes sometimes, uh, so there are you know, scales of costs. If we're manufacturing more, does that already, does it cause you to anticipate a drop in costs? Well, that, that's uh, one factor, but uh, it's, not it's not the main driver. We have really to design the product to the cost so that we can use manufacturing methods that allow us to, to run high volume, low investment cost, and mm -hmm. uh, high, speed, high speed production, mm -hmm. and the precision and quality that's required for the product. Okay. So otherwise, we will increase uh, the scrap rate too much, and then the price of the products will not uh, fit. To, to the expectations. 
Okay. I should mention that if anyone does have a question from the audience, all you need to do is raise your hand and uh, 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 Raymond will try his best to deal with them. Uh, so will I. I um, uh, would like to shift. Uh, you already, this is largely, we've been talking about the PEM cell uh, factor. Uh, you mentioned that as a major focus. You also mentioned reformer technology. What type of reformers, what is your involvement there? Our reformer um, involvement is more is based on our know-how on thermal management. Mm -hmm. That means uh, together with the catalyst supplier and uh, the, the customer, we create a thermal management system that fits the catalyst requirements as well as um, the thermal uh, characteristics, um, mainly on PEM cells. Mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, low temperature as well as high temperature PEM activities uh, we are running here um, and uh, together with these three partners we try to optimize uh, the total concept and our activity here is also to design this unit then for a manufacturing process that fits then the entire uh, benefits mm -hmm. for the customer. Have the scales for reformer technology, uh, I should add, um, uh, th there's a number of issues, uh, you know, reformers for what? Uh, already there are relatively large scale projects where they're installing uh, PEM cells with reformers in people's homes. They've got them up and running. Yeah. Uh, they use natural gas um, and a reformer. And people would say, well, it's still a non-renewable energy. It's natural gas. But in fact, because they're 30% more effective in using the energy in natural gas, it decreases our emissions uh, by 30%. Yeah. It's just a question of... Uh, but the interesting thing for me is when you start installing these devices on a large scale, as the scales increase, um, uh, we're still going to run out of the fossil fuels. At some point, we're going to run out. And the interesting thing with this reformer technology, as opposed to other technologies, is you have a PEM cell that uh, you simply bypass the reformer if you've got pure hydrogen yeah. um, as opposed to some other technologies which really require uh, natural gas. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, for me, I see a historical chance, an opportunity, a window here for uh, creating um, a, a larger scale application of fuel cells. Have you been seeing already changes in the demand for reformers? No, I think it's still the complexity and the costs of reformers is still a main um, issue mm -hmm. um, and uh, in a way a, a sort of a hurdle to market uh, PEM fuel cells. Um, everyone is waiting for the high temperature PEM fuel cells to become ready to, uh, to have allow for more simplified reformer systems and lower mm -hmm. cost on the reformer side. Um, but in a way, there is still some, some way to go to get it um, in a serial production mode. Mm -hmm. um, due to that, everyone is waiting for a reformer PEM system based on natural gas or propane uh, mm -hmm. uh, due to the simplicity of the infrastructure, but it, um, it's still on a lower uh, scale of uh, development, mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah. Is there any reason why this process is uh, taking so much time? Is it simply an issue of cost? It, it is uh, mainly an issue of cost and the complexity of the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the systems are functional, but basically um, uh, the non-renewable resources are still so inexpensive that the yeah. emphasis is not there to, yes. to change. Yeah. Okay, so they're, they're basically pilot projects. Yeah. Um, uh, what hopes, I mean, there are skeptical uh, perspectives on this industry, they're the optimists. Mm -hmm. uh, to which school do you belong? Are you more optimistic in the long run or a little skeptical? Well, in, in the long run, we are certainly still very optimistic. That's why we continuously invest in this technology. Uh, we think um, together with the renewables, it's an uh, ideal fit. Mm -hmm. um, the, f the, the whole fuel cell uh, use, if it's uh, portable or um, uh, mobile or um, automotive mm -hmm. um, or stationary. Mm -hmm. um, so due to that, I think um, we're closer to the market uh, ever than mm -hmm. ever. So um, 
we will we hope we will see very clear market perspectives in the next uh, three to four years. Mm -hmm. There's certainly this inevitability. At some point, the non-renewable resources will be expensive, uh, and their uh, quantity is declining continuously. So yeah. there's some end point there. Uh, again, if there is any question from the audience, just feel free to raise your hand. Um, it, it, the last issue in this whole chain of issues for me is, uh, you already mentioned um, uh, renewable resources. Uh, there is uh, some statement of political will that by 2050, um, over 80% of our energy in Germany should be um, renewable. And we're la basically talking about the wind and solar, mm -hmm. which are hysterically unreliable. There's a lot one day, there's less. Uh, this is not what we want uh, for a continuous supply. So uh, uh, there are various ways of dealing with this. We basically know right now to store a terawatt of energy, uh, uh, the concepts we have, however functional they are, for instance, pumping water up into a lake, yeah. There are not enough lakes up on hills within this nation mm -hmm. to store all that energy. So basically, there is no way around mm -hmm. uh, using, for example, electrolysis uh, to store that energy. Mm -hmm. uh, finding some way to store it, there's various ways of doing that. You pump some into the natural gas pipeline. There are underground mines. This is already a concept that people are talking about as almost inescapable to some extent. It may not be the only. I'm a fan of saying the solutions, as you said, the PEM cells, is it going to be a high temperature or a low temperature? Maybe it's both. We don't know. There may be a number of solutions, but we already know there is this huge issue of not simply using old thoughts. You use the grid to send all of the wind power from the north of Germany to the south. Nonsensical. It wastes energy. Convert it on site into hydrogen. With this outlook, uh, do you believe, you already know that I'm convinced, I'm preaching here, but do you believe that there's an inescapable environment it may take until 2050 uh, for hydrogen fuel cells um, in light of that quasi-necessity to change tracks? Yeah, I think um, fuel cells, or especially PEM fuel cells, are directly connected to the hydrogen uh, uh, availability and due to uh, to the infrastructure and uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, topic of renewables and uh, the high flexibility or high uh, changing uh, availability of renewables uh, mm -hmm. hydrogen has its uh, benefits uh, and so uh, fuel cell will have and uh, uh, to uh, use renewables as whatever sort of uh, energy or electric energy stored in hydrogen mm -hmm. Are you already involved in the reformer side of the equation? Uh, the, so I should say the electrolysis side of the equation? We provide components to some basic research, but not on a scale we would like to. Okay, so like that to. may be another market for yeah. you. Yes. Okay, I see you have your uh, fingers in the pie in all directions. Yeah. Uh, uh, will you be back next year, and what changes do you expect in the near future? I think um, at the moment our planning is uh, to be back uh, here next year. We, this is a good platform for us to network um, with suppliers or customers or with the whole industry. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, how the, mar uh, the situation will uh, develop and hopefully uh, upstream. Mm -hmm. Hopefully upstream. Yeah. I'll second that. <laughs> if we um, uh, don't have any questions from the audience, I haven't seen any hands here. Um, I would like to thank you uh, very much, um, uh, Dr. Raymond Strobel, uh, Director of European Fuel Cell Projects at Dana Holding. Without such a large company and their expertise getting involved in this industry, um, uh, uh, many of the uh, contributors would be at a loss to progress. So it certainly is, I love the humility here, we don't know who you work with, uh, but secretly, like that magic um, uh, source in the background, you've been providing skills and expertise um, uh, to the whole industry. So thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. <laughs>
and thank you very much for your attention. We have come to the end of our presentation for uh, this uh, day, Monday. We'll be back on Tuesday, 10 in the morning. Join us again. The drinks are on the house as ever. And uh, we'll continue our talk about fuel cells and uh, the fuel cell economy. Thank you.